Hi, I'm Pam, and I would like to welcome you to the Live Authentically show. My team and I help other people step into their authentic realities via a number of different modalities. This show is obviously one of them. We also have a private Facebook group, and you can find us at liveauthentically.today slash FB. I'm also super pumped because I just released my first book. It's called SOAR, S-O-A-R. You can find it on Amazon. It's available in audiobook, paperback, and Kindle. And it's a spiritual experiential journey through a transformative life event and shows how I partnered with the universe to create my new reality. I am super excited that on today's show with me, I have Dan Reeves. Hi, Dan. Hello. Thank you so much for joining me. I am very happy to be here. It's uh, bumping into you has been a wonderful thing. Oh, thank you. Likewise, likewise. I firmly believe there are no coincidences and the universe yeah. always puts the, the right people in our paths at exactly the right time. So we are meant to be here today to hear Dan's story of addiction and recovery. It's an amazingly powerful story of healing. I know it's something that so many people are struggling with right now. You know, this issue of substance abuse, especially during the pandemic. I know it's fear and anxiety has been heightened. People are turning to coping mechanisms. And I'm super excited to hear about your journey and your story through your healing process and um, how you've done such an amazing job of turning your experience into a gift to the world. So I'm so proud of you for doing that work. So before we get started and dive into the details of your story, I'd love to start off my show with the same question that I ask all of my guests. And that is, what does it mean to you to live authentically every day? Yeah, I but, uh, had totally forgot about the pop quiz. <laughs> My previous life to style, I couldn't show up two places as the same guy, even 10 minutes from one another. This mask wearing thing that, that I found myself doing. So living authentic today is taking off all those masks and showing up as who Dan is, the real Dan, no matter where I'm at, who I'm with. If you meet me and you talk to somebody else, those people are going to know they're talking about the same person. That wasn't always the case with me. Almost, it's almost like solidifying multiple personalities or something like that, where you have, I had all these people and I finally boiled it down to who Dan Reeves really is. I love that. So tell me a little bit more about that when you were trying to maintain this facade, right? These images that you were trying to cast. Tell me a little bit more about the different personas you were casting into the world. You know, growing up, and I hear this from other people in addiction circles as I interview people about their journey from uh, addiction to health to recovery, this thing of just not never feeling like I could fit in. I always felt like there was something missing and I was always trying to figure out how to be what you needed me to be so that you would like me, right? Yeah. So when I hung around with different elements, I, a jock, I suppose you could used to say, and also I hung around with what might be looked at as the other side of the tracks. Mm -hmm. So early on as a kid, you know, I learned that I needed to morph even from a standpoint of what kind of clothes I wore. You know, when I showed up for the football party at some guy's house, you know, I had to have a eyes off with a pops collar or whatever at that time, you know. And when I showed up down with my buddies on the other side of town, you know, it was a Levi jacket and tore up blue jeans and doing that kind of thing. And it's kind of like a chameleon, you know. You have to end up like changing your colors to match whatever environment you're sitting in. And as I grew, I just became more part of, you know, obviously as life takes you along, became part of different environments. So then I have a work one and then eventually a father one and then, you know, a husband. And I was even wearing masks like that and really never really showing anybody who the real guy was. Now, they would have peaks in at that because you can't hide yourself completely. Right. But I uh, always felt that I needed to be, you know, in order to be accepted because of the whole fear of rejection and abandonment, stuff like that, that I've now learned it was to the, at the core of a lot of that. I had to be what you needed me to be so you would like me. Yeah, and how did that feel to have to keep changing and morphing and trying to please everyone all the time? You know, it felt normal. But now that I'm down the road and done some work on myself and have a, I like a, Bill Wilson in the Alcoholics Anonymous textbook, he says, uh, having had a little spiritual development now, I can, uh, is it was exhausting is what it really was. It was exhausting trying to, uh, to, it, uh, you know, it's almost like being like in a real fast moving play where you might have to do changes of costume in between. Uh, that's the, uh, that's the kind of energy I felt like, like you had to dive in the phone booth and change your clothes and dive out. And one of the biggest fears is, is mixing those things and having two of these 
two or more of these elements in the same spot. And then I got to figure out well, how to, <laughs> how to uh, manage that guy. Mm-hmm. Cause I was doing things, you know, I, I was, I, was a, I guess you could say an upper middle-class kid. I grew up with two parents in the home. Uh, I can't lay any of my alcoholism at the feet of my upbringing. A lot of people will, will talk about that, you know, their, how they were brought up and, and, uh, and I can't do that. Uh, now, you know, all, all parents have, you know, nobody's perfect. Uh, I'm learning that today as a father big time. Um, that, uh, so I, I, I grew up looking like this normal, well-adjusted kid, but inside I was the furthest from that. Now it had some early on trauma and some things that, that, that now know that, uh, that had an impact on me. I'd had, a uh, probably the biggest thing was, and, and I'm, this just doesn't carry weight like it used to. Uh, it was, it was one of my take it to the grave things that I'd had, a uh, began exploring sexually with a friend, a boy. Uh, as a young, young kid, like, and I really don't even, I say another thing. I say, if I knew I was, if I knew I was going to be telling this story, I'd have kept better track and it's hard to get the chronological part of it to mesh. And I've just let go of that. Cause I think we block, we do, I think our mind does some survival techniques to, to work around that. But, uh, that was one of the first things that, that, that really started changing who I was, uh, because it, it confused me about my sexuality uh, it, it just completely confused me. And it, and it had a lot of shame wrapped up around it somehow or another, got the message that that was wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I've let that go today, but, but to carry that into your forties and still be hiding it, yeah. uh, and, and, and overcompensating, you know, cause I didn't, you know, uh, I needed to prove to you, even though you didn't even know that I had to prove to you that, uh, you know, for whatever, you know, I had to prove that I was a, uh, uh, a straight guy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah Overcompensating yeah. kind of that hyper masculinity, right. Stepping into that role. Right. Yep. Yeah. yeah. The sports, the shooting, the guns, the, you know, doing yeah. lean in that direction. Now I think all that stuff really did was suited me, but it, but, but the, you know, everything we can, we can do this stuff at unhealthy levels and, and that can even go with my recovery. You know, I have to keep balance still in my life. Uh, and, and I didn't know how to do that. So, you know, so uh, just a nutshell for a minute, you know, when I hit recovery, when I came into the 12 step programs, uh, I heard this thing and there's a concept in there of being spiritually sick. And what I heard people tell me is I wasn't doing religion, right. You know, okay. that I was not that, you know, uh, and, and I couldn't accept that. I rejected that out of the box. Uh, what I've come to know now is that, Events and experiences uh, over my lifetime have stepped on my spirit mm-hmm. and have caused my spirit to be wounded. Mm-hmm. And uh, without any real way to know how to deal with that stuff, the only thing I could do is internalize it and stuff it down, uh, like visualizing I've got this backpack on my back. It's a trash can with, with shoulder straps. And every event that I come down through and bump into in my life, I'm going to be putting it in that can. We just pick it up and carry it. And, uh, and so you have good stuff and bad stuff that you're putting in your can, but kind of like that bad apple in a, in a, in a barrel, it'll tend to make the other apples bad. So over my course of my life, I've had these little things and it's kind of like a, um, nothing, you know, nothing has been really huge to, to step on my spirit, but these little things bullying, you know, for, I remember a couple of years where I had to run home from school because I was sprayed. I couldn't get caught. I'd get, I'd get physically abused. I'd get beat up if I got caught. Uh, that was terribly embarrassing. And then a couple of years later, I turn around, and I start bullying guys that are weaker than me. And you know, so I'm doing these things and just bouncing off a of life without any real guidebook of how to, how to do this thing. And so my spirit got sick. And that's what we say about being spiritually sick. My actual spirit, my essence, my soul, the thing is like a, uh, a fingerprint uh, that nobody, you know, makes me, me, makes you, you, no two people have it the same. Uh, that essence of Dan, uh, became sick. And, and the problem with that is, is I can't accept that. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I can't, I can't come to grips with that. It's actually, if I just try harder, if I just do better, if I just, you know, if I just manipulate and manage my life better, uh, there's a line in the big book that says, uh, I am the victim of the delusion that I can rest uh, satisfaction and happiness out of this life if I only manage well. And doing that wasn't working. Mm-hmm. 
So when I was about 14 or so, and I do know it was about that time, uh, I got offered my first chance to, uh, to smoke a little pot Okay. and, uh, and drinking had been normalized around my house, but I didn't really have alcoholism. I had an uncle, but that, that probably would fall into that department, but, uh, it wasn't overt alcoholism like what you, you know, what the, he was a nice guy. He just drank too much. Um, so there was always alcohol around. And so it was normalized to do that. But uh, still inside, there was a, a little feeling of, um, Dan, you really shouldn't be doing this. You know, this inner self has been trying to protect me all along and I've overrode it. But uh, so that started me out on this path. And, and what happened whenever I first started doing drugs and uh, drinking was that uh, all that scared, uh, not knowing how to do this thing, all that uh, lack of self-esteem fell off of me. And I hear it time and time again in, in the circles as I interview people that it feels like you had found the golden key. Mm-hmm. You know, I found the key to how to do this thing called life. I can, you know, I can dance with the girls at the dance at school. I can, you know, I, I'm all of a sudden able to, uh, what I felt was, I felt it was showing up authentically. Mm-hmm. It's the farthest from that. And problem, and it might have actually been some truth to that where it lowers your inhibitions at first and you start doing that. But, but you, you know, I believe this thing and, and I, I know it's a more than I believe, but this, uh, this alcoholism really is a disease, no different than any other mental illness. And, and I just wrap it up with the word alcoholism, whether if it's addiction or whatever you're, you know, the spiritual sickness that uh, has got me reaching for uh, unhealthy coping mechanisms that I end up dependent upon, uh, addicted, that uh, that that's in me somehow genetically. And I was born with that. And I really didn't have a chance to defeat it. And that's part of our powerlessness uh, concept in the 12 steps is that uh, I'm not to blame for this. I'm sick. I'm not a bad person. I'm a sick person. And uh, through using these tools in the 12 steps, we can put this stuff into permanent remission. It's like cancer in remission forever. And uh, so after that first time, I started, you know, wanting to do that more and more because that was a state of mind where I felt comfortable. And it's pretty tough to do that when you're a young kid. You can't just go to the liquor store and buy some beer. Uh, now you can lift it out of, out of the basement refrigerator and you can get it in certain ways. And we found ways to do it. We would sit on our bicycles at the liquor store and offer people money to go in and buy it for us. Uh, but the pot guy, he didn't care about how old you were. You know, the drug man, he didn't check your ID. Uh, so that actually became easier to come by. And, uh, I never was really short on money. So that wasn't, that didn't stop me from being able to buy what I wanted to buy. And as time went on, you know, I had my driver's license for six months. I got my first DUI and, uh, and I was drinking, you know, I was drinking and driving on a bicycle before I had a driver's license. And then I lost my driver's license at at 16. Uh, I played high school basketball and was pretty good. Uh, It was actually pretty promising. And I ended up uh, smoking some dope on a, on the way back on the bus from a away game, which is just insanity. Uh, step two says we believe a power greater than ourselves can restore us to sanity. And if I want to talk about some insanity, that was insane to think I was going to get away with smoking marijuana on the bus on the way home from a game. So I got kicked off that team uh, and, and wasn't able to ever make the team again. Uh, I had my second DUI by the time I was 19. Mm-hmm. And those things just started to teach me how to do it better. Uh, rather than stop drinking and driving, I, uh, I I would do a pilot's checklist on my car and make sure everything, Krissa, Krissa, uh, I started uh, learning to do it better. And I went a big on big string and that stuff started soaking in on me. And, and I had a like a 19 year run of absolutely no real consequences other than personal stuff, uh, okay. drinking and doping. Okay. Uh, I got another DUI when I was 38 years old. So that was number three. And I'm sailing through life. So I get, I, I get married. I have 2.3 kids. I got a car, uh, two cars in a garage. Okay. I've had a, held a job for 20 something years. And I'm a full blown alcoholic and drug addict. And I can't accept that because drug addicts and alcoholics don't have all the stuff that I had. You yeah. can't. How were you able to do that? How were you able to pull that off and maintain this like seemingly normal life for you? seem to have it all and 
and be so deeply dependent on substances? I would love to know the question to that. Some people end up bottoming very quickly. Today's world with the heroin and stuff like that, people reach a bottom very violently and quickly. Uh, somehow or another, I managed that for all those years. Uh, and looking like a normal dude. Now, you know, I, you know, I remember these things and, and people would see me once in a while. Like we would get opportunity to go to the Cincinnati Reds ball game. Somebody from work would take us out and get us a limo and pick us up in Louisville and take us to the ball game. And that's one of my, you know, I remember I, what I did a lot was overshot the mark. So now I'm sleeping in the, in the, uh, what they call it at the ball games where you get a special little area. There's a name for that. I can't remember. They rented out a special room for us to be in and I'm passed out in the corner you know, and it's a second inning, you know, and so then I'm sleeping on the way home. I had these, so there would be these little looks into my alcoholism and, and a lot of people started putting those puzzle pieces together as I began to come clean and, and, and like through the amends process generally in, in alcohol, in the 12 steps, I uh, started having to face the people that I'd harmed and people would say, you know, I always thought there was something, but you just didn't look like it. So I, I don't know the answer to how I pulled that off. I guess, you know, to some extent, uh, the universe has been taking care of me, even through my madness, even through the crazy. Uh, all I can say is that that stuff, you know, I was able to carry on to get to where I am today. Because without all that, uh, I wouldn't be who I was. So we do this thing. And when we talk in uh, our tell our stories around the podiums in 12 uh, step meetings around the world, we say uh, we tell it in a general way what it was like, what happened and what it's like now. Yeah. So that whole bunch of. Uh, 40 years or so, uh, just progressed in a flash. And the alcohol is no longer working for me. Uh, I'm not big on the drugs really, but I'll do anything and have done just about everything. Um, but I'm a daily drinker and it's mostly beer. And I stop after work and I go across the street from work and I grab a whatever size box of beer I think I need for today and would drink in myself into oblivion and I would I didn't sleep in my own bed with my wife for uh I don't really know let's just say 10 years I fell asleep in my recliner I drink myself to sleep every night and it just became a groundhog day over and over and over and you know and I had kids during that time and I'm trying to manage things but you know when you looked yourself in the mirror in the morning uh you knew that what you were presenting to the world was not what you are and uh, and, and, you know, that stacks up shame and a whole bunch of other feelings. But so the alcohol stops working. I can't drink enough to feel good anymore. No matter how much, I can't get it in me. And like really quickly, I get this headache. And I think that the next beer, the headache will go away. And I think, no, well, it wasn't that one. It'll be the next one. And I try to drink this headache away. Um, and one day I come home from work and I was picking up my kids from my parents' house. And uh, my mom had just had a back surgery. And this was like someplace around in 2005 neighborhood. And, uh, and I'm walking around the house with my three or four beers that I've had in me in the way home. And I'm kind of pacing the house, wanting to get my kids out of here and get going. And I see a bottle in my mom's, two bottles in my mom's bedroom that said, uh, uh, both of them, I picked them up, whatever reason, I was drawn straight to these prescription bottles and I picked them up and they both said for pain. And I had some pain. Yeah. So I took two of each pills and put them in, I actually took them out of the bottles and there was two little, there were, some of them were little ones and some of them were big ones. And I took the two little ones and I took them. What they ended up being was Oxycontin. Uh, I had no idea. So I, in about 15 minutes, the world completely righted itself. It was just like when I took that first drink at 14 oh. and all of a sudden I found the golden key. I mean, I was, the alcohol, everything just turned perfect. Uh, I had a crazy part. I have pictures from that night because my at this point in time, my wife is working uh, weekends only second shift. So I had the kids all weekend while she worked. And then she was home with them all week while I worked. Mm -hmm. uh, I have pictures of them in do rags and things from that night's party because dad was feeling OK today. Uh, and that started that uh, opiate addiction. And what, a, that, that, what that did was hyper accelerated my alcoholism. It brought me to a bottom pretty doggone quick because I was then on the hunt for that. Uh, I wore out a doctor uh, or two with prescriptions where they wouldn't give them to you anymore. Uh, when that ran out, I started taking them from you. If I was at your house, it was amazing how many people had those medications sitting around in their kitchen cabinets or medicine cabinets. Uh, so if I visited you and you had some when I left, uh, you didn't have them anymore. You had less than you did than you did. 
And oh. I started stealing them from my friends and aunts and uncles and everybody I could find. And then I started inviting myself to other people's houses. Uh, I conned myself into your house to use your restroom or whatever. Uh, and I do that. And then I ended up uh, breaking in houses. I ended up uh, actually burglarizing houses to get medication. Uh, and, uh, you know, so you want to talk about like the two images, you know, you said what that looked like. So yeah. in one thing, I'm a dressed in, in black ski mask kind of burglar coming in and finding an open window in your house or breaking one and slipping in your house and stealing. And I didn't, you know, I ran across money and didn't take it, but I wanted that. I wanted those pills. Mm -hmm. So in, in one light, I'm this cat burglar dude, this, and in the other light, I'm showing up in my engineering job in the morning in my khakis and my button down shirt and running a team of, uh, of designers and draftsmen that are working on $25 million projects. Anybody would know that it's not going to last long. And I had a house across the street here was an old man. Uh, they were in their 90s. And uh, one day they called me up and asked me if I'd come over and help him get back up into his motorized wheelchair. And when I did that, uh, I have a radar for those pills. And I saw that he had what I liked. So he started being a real regular thing. Uh, I would slip over there into his house and, uh, and get what I needed. And he had a good supply of it. And, and, and I got, a, you know, I would walk through their house while they were sitting watching TV at night. Mm -hmm. They both could and slip right behind them and walk in that house and get them. And in the beginning of that, they were in the front of the house and slowly those pills got moved back further in the house. So at some point, and, uh, and I know the date, it was, uh, June, June the 18th of 2014. I have a new girlfriend here to home. I'd lost my, my marriage through this alcohol and addiction thing. Uh, still held my job. I got a new girlfriend, her daughter and my daughter are asleep back in their, in my daughter's bedroom. My son's asleep. Uh, and I get up and I tell her, I'll be back in just a minute. Mm -hmm. And I walk out the back door and I do as I've done so many other times. I walked her out the back door, went around the house, slipped over across the street. Uh, by this time, they're locking the house, but they're, uh, they're leaving a key under a brick out in the front yard for me to get in. That's a joke. But I found ways into the house no matter what. Mm. And, uh, and I slipped in this house and uh, it was completely dark. And I go back in the old man's bedroom and I know he's got him in this he's laying asleep facing me with the TV on and I open the, the dresser drawer. I reach in, I get what I need, shake out some of them in my hand and I turn around and there's a silhouette standing there with a baseball bat and pepper spray. Oh, no. And, uh, he hit me with that pepper spray from about six inches from my eyeballs and started laying into me with that baseball bat. Yeah. Uh, this was the, this is the old folks, uh, son. Now I have lived on this street for a lot of years, so he knew who I was. Uh, and the, also, uh, he had caught me in that house six months prior to that too. And he let me off the hook and, uh, on the promise that I would get treatment. And, uh, and I didn't. And that time, uh, this time around, he wasn't quite as nice as he was the first time around. Yeah. Luckily we were in a hallway and he couldn't really get me with that baseball bat very well, but I, uh, wrestled my way through him through and I left the house. And, uh, and, and I ran. And when I talked about them bullying and running from those kids when I was like in the eighth grade, and there would be a time where you'd run so fast, you'd be almost like an out of body experience up on my toes where I don't even like there's a pad of air. And that run that night from that dude felt a lot like that 12 year old little boy running. I disappeared for the night and uh, I uh, didn't know what to do. And I remember saying that over and over again. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Uh, I watched my house and come back. I grew up in this neighborhood. And for You wouldn't be able to find me in this neighborhood. I ran it as a kid. Uh, I still live in this house. or I've since bought it back from mom and dad um, or bought it. Um, I kept coming back and the police were here and they had headlights painted across the front of the house and the back of the house. And, and, and I would disappear and I'd come back and I had no idea what I was going to do. That's one of the things I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. And I, uh, thought about stepping out in front of cars. I thought about committing suicide. I had no idea how to come back home to what I had just done. Uh, that image that I tried to hold was crushed. You know, it was over. Uh, uh I ended up coming back. I have no, I don't have a shirt on. 
I don't have a phone. I'm in short pants and loafer type shoes because I wasn't planning on being out for the night. Uh, When I slipped back at one point, the cops were gone and the house was completely lit up. And I peeked around the front of the house and I saw that this girlfriend's car was still there. I was surprised to see that, but even more surprised I was, uh, and I don't really know why I was surprised to see this, but my parents' car was in the driveway. And uh, I sat down under a pine tree in my backyard and uh, just sat down and put my arm across my arms, across my knees and, and put my head down. And I heard the back door come open and uh, I saw my dad step out of the, out of the back of the house carrying two five gallon buckets that looked very heavy uh he started down the path with those buckets that was going to lead right past me and i was trying to be as small as i could possibly be that he wouldn't see me and uh he stopped on that path right in front of me and i heard him call my name and he said dan and i looked up and i said yeah and he goes are you hurt are you okay and that was not what i was expecting to hear uh He set down those buckets, which uh, I found were full of glass. Uh, And the next feeling I felt was uh, him coming and sitting down beside me uh, and put his hand on my knee. And he told me, let's go in, take a shower, hit the sack. We'll deal with this tomorrow. It's all going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Okay was not some future I could see. Uh, That guy had come over. He thought I ran home. And that guy had come over and uh, busted in my house. He brought that baseball bat. He raked out the side lights on both sides of my front door. He knocked out the window on the front of the house. And he came in and started tearing up everything that he could with that ball bat. This gal that was here at my house had no idea. All she knew was that I just a few minutes ago said, I'll be back in just a minute. Mm-hmm. Uh, he busts out the mirrors, uh, furniture. And she's, I think she was in the restroom and didn't have any idea, thought it was gunshots going off. And so she is crouched down in the back of the house to protect those children in those bedrooms. And they come and meet face to face in the hallway. And, uh, and I brought these two people together through my actions. Uh, they had no business knowing each other, uh, brought into a madness that is beyond understanding. And, uh, and that's part of what my, this disease, alcoholism, does you know it, it affects people outside it affects the people who don't even have the disease very few diseases yeah. affect people outside the disease the way alcoholism does yeah. he busted everything up and my dad was cleaning up all that glass and he was repairing all that stuff and um i came in the house took a uh shower well i come in the house to face the teary eyes of my mom and this girlfriend uh they knew I had a problem, but they didn't know to what extent. And I uh, walked in, faced them, took a shower, went to bed somehow or another. I woke up in the morning, uh, took another shower, got ready for work, walked in the backyard, strolled out to the backyard, picked up the rock I'd held, hid those handful of pills under the night before, throwed six of them in my mouth, swallowed them, put the rest of them in my pocket, and moved on with my day. And there's a, uh, that's another, how we say cunning, baffling, and powerful about this deal called alcoholism. And uh, I will, there's a line in the big book that says, we we can't bring to force sufficient memory of the suffering and humiliation of the weeks or months before. And I was swallowing and putting away the suffering and the humiliation of last night. I picked up the pills the very next morning and that was the best, that's, that's all I had in me. That's the only coping tool I had was was dope so i ended up standing in front of a judge in uh here in my hometown new Albany, indiana and the judge told me uh mr reeves the standard sentence for a crime you committed is six to 20 years in the indiana department of corrections um to 20 years that's what he said now you know how do you feel at that moment how did that feel to hear that well it's it's the gates of hell shutting behind you right I thought my life was completely over. I knew I couldn't go to prison. Uh, from that moment, I was trying to figure out how not to do that. And even if that meant suicide, uh, I was but not going to go to prison. Yeah, I was, I'm curious. On your journey, was that your rock bottom moment? I'm always interested to find out before the recovery and the healing started, what was the rock bottom moment? Was that, that was it? it? 
that yeah. that that those those and you know one of the things about alcoholism and bottoms come in various forms right i have a sponsee whose bottom was he lost his girlfriend you know uh I have ones that are, uh, you know, a hell, homeless guy. My bottom was uh, those charges and that consequences. The, the problem with life is, is it doesn't seem that we make any changes until we have severe consequences. Right. Rarely do we get up on a good day. You know, now that's funny. That's a little different because I can say that today. I will wake up today and actually take action towards a better life without any consequences. <laughs> uh, You're on a different but, path now, though. You're on that path of, of living yeah. in the light, that path of healing, that path yeah. of changing the world. And when you are on that path, you no longer, re- we l- no longer rely on those rock bottoms or those lows. So look, we've yeah. been, there. we've all had them in different forms. So when we're on that path of healing and changing the world, we're just on that natural trajectory of just wanting to continually improve ourselves. But that doesn't come until we've hit that rock bottom. Right. Um, and I'm always interested to hear what people's rock bottoms are. Tell me that was it for me was getting that, you know, and, and, you know, I went six more months and, and so my bottom was a long thing, you know, that event is what changed my trajectory, but I still couldn't stop drinking. Now I stopped breaking in houses. I did stop breaking in houses. I did stop the pain pills, but I still couldn't stop drinking. Okay. So I was going to court every couple of weeks, going to pre-trials and doing all these conferences and this stuff where they would, you know, talk about what they were going to do to Dan and, uh, and, and I would, I'd drink myself to oblivion every single time that would happen. Mm-hmm. Wow. Uh, my buddy at work knew what was going on. I confided to him and he was struggling with some similar issues. And he was kept on telling me about this particular Tuesday night meeting I ought to come to. And uh, there's another dynamic I find and uh, I've heard it from a pretty famous now deceased uh, 12 step speaker named Burl, Bob Earl is that when you bring something to me that's working for you, mm-hmm. my default is to reject whatever it is you got. You know, and I even look at that sometimes. I mean, just be as silly as like when somebody comes around with a plate of chocolate chip cookies. Do you want one? I say, no, thank you. I'm fine. Uh, I want the whole tray of cookies. But I'll. And so my buddy's offering me this thing, and I and I won't take it. And uh, one day on a Tuesday, uh, I had a court appointment, and I've been going. I went to this meeting a couple times, and it was really sinking in on me. And a particular gentleman in there who was sharing was really gelling with me and I could hear him. We just, that's the thing about the storytelling of what we do here. Sometimes your story, your story will touch somebody. Right. Uh, and this guy's voice was touching me. Uh, and we do this thing in my group where we say all men who are available and willing to take another man through the 12 steps, please raise your hand. That means what we call sponsoring you. So they would do that thing. And that makes it a lot easier to go ask a guy who just raised his hand and said, I'm open. Than to try to find a sponsor. They keep on telling you 12 steps, find a sponsor. This guy never did raise his hand ever. And uh, that Tuesday, uh, uh, the court date, I didn't, I, I joke around, but there's really some uh, truth to this is that I thought if I missed this meeting, if I drank today, I wouldn't go to the meeting. Mm-hmm. And if I missed a meeting, that'll be the day this some buck raises his hand. Uh, so I sat in my misery all day long because that's what I did. And when I, I just could not live with that in my shoulders and I would drink to oblivion every single court date. I would clear my schedule. Did not go to work. Uh, I'm, on my, I'm out on pro, um, pro, uh, I'm out on bail. I'm not supposed to be drinking. I'm my whole, I'm, you know, everybody around me knows I'm not supposed to be drinking, but I'm pretending to be sober. I'm not letting anybody see me. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I went to that meeting that night and I carried that guilt and shame and remorse in there that night. We do a thing called a burning desire. And that's if anybody has something they really need to get off their chest. So up until now, I'm telling these fellows in this AA meeting, I'm okay. I actually started my first AA meeting was in 2011 and this is in 2014. Uh, I put together a year of sobriety in 2011. Uh, that's prior to this breaking in thing. Uh, but I just couldn't maintain my recovery. I set the tools down. You'll hear that over and over. So that night I uh, walked in there and I was so full that when they said, has anybody got a burning desire? I dumped my bucket and I told all these guys the truth about what was going on with me all the way down to the nitty gritty. And, and I cried that night when I released that in that meeting. And as I see happen so often in 12 step meetings, man, that group rose up and told me things like uh, we've never seen anybody do the 12 steps and still go to jail. Well, I couldn't believe that. They said, Hey, if you do go to jail, we'll come visit you. Uh, if you're, you know, they just were basically opening up their arms telling them they would do anything, uh, anything for me. And what they did there was poured hope into me, yeah. uh, gave me some hope. And after that meeting, that guy who never raised his hand to sponsor people walked up to me and uh, said, Dan, thank you for sharing all that. 
very powerful. I want to sponsor you. Oh my goodness. And uh, I walked out of that church that night knowing that, that God, the universe had, uh, had laid a gift at my hands. And that guy also said, but I'm going to have to, we got to get some stuff straight. He said, uh, do you have a new big, do you have a big book? And that's our Alcoholics Anonymous big book. And I said, yeah, yeah, I got one. And he goes, this guy ain't writing in it. And I said, yeah, I got all kinds of stuff highlighted in it and underlined and tabbed. And he said, well, uh, get rid of it and get a brand new one because we're going to do it completely different this time. Okay. He said, do you have a, he said, Tuesday nights after this meeting is my only open window. Is that going to be convenient for you? I said, yes. <laughs> uh, he laid down a number of ground rules. You're going to call me every day between one and three. The very next day I called him at 2 PM because that is exactly between one and three. Yeah. And I just started doing what this sponsor told me to do. And he walked me through these 12 steps, which I didn't think would work. And I sat under in the, under my breath every time he would give me assignment. Uh, what are we doing here? You know, this is crazy. I'm getting ready to go to prison and you've got me writing a list of people I'm mad at, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> uh, and he walked me through this 12 step process, uh, and a lot of magical things. And I have a miracle list and I actually have a podcast of my own that's got this miracle list where I talk about it up to when a couple of years ago of these unbelievable things that happened in my life as I walked this. And, and, I, and I'd be remiss if I didn't tell this one briefly is that I was supposed to go, we'd, we'd signed a uh, agreement. They finally ended up coming down to let me do home incarceration. And now this all, you know, they weren't budging at all until I met this man and started doing this work. And all of a sudden, they don't know how this guy, and they don't know what I'm doing. But all of a sudden, the court system starts being more agreeable to me, just magically. Mm -hmm. And uh, But they said, they're not going to let me do home incarceration at that house because you was breaking into that house. Uh, and this neighborhood really wanted me to go to jail. They were, I'd right. violated a sacred, I'd violated the security of the neighborhood in a way that, that a lot of people couldn't forgive. And they wanted me to do some time. So they're down petitioning the, the prosecutor and stuff to put me behind bars. And by this time they had said, uh, this home incarceration thing was being entertained and I was offered a chance to do home incarceration someplace else. So we cut a deal and I was going to do it at my mo mom and dad's house. I was 45 years old. I was going to move back into mom and dad's a uh, week or so before I was supposed to make that move. Uh, and my whole, you know, the whole court finalization of, of the charges and all that. I go over to my mom and dad's house to clean out the bedroom. And uh, my mom had always had a pill problem. And as I said earlier about my parents were pretty good. My mom was a professional, but she was, a, she was addicted to the pain pills. And that's actually, as I told you earlier, that's where I found my first pain pills. And that's who I first started stealing them from. And uh, mom thought mom was off of them. And she had done that and told me that. And that was probably for my benefit. But I honestly thought that she was because I didn't see the same behaviors in her. But that day I walked in there, my mom's chin was resting on her chest and she had that normal opiate doze out. You've heard people talking about nodding off and all that. And my mom and I looked and there was a bottle of those pain pills sitting right beside her. And I flipped out because I knew I couldn't stay sober in that house. Not with those pain pills. I couldn't do it. There's no way. I did not have the power to stay sober with those pain pills in there. And, and remember earlier when I was saying, I was walking around the streets and I was saying, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I walked out of her house the same way. My dad said, Hey, where are you going? I thought you was going to clean up that room. And I said, uh, something come up. I got to go. And, and I walked outside and I said, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And I, the first time I remember, I actually didn't know what to do. I had one little thing to do and that was call my sponsor. Mm -hmm. And I did that. And he answered and I told him what was going on. And he has this calmness about him on everything because I was the furthest thing from calm. And he said, look, we can't go back to the till and ask for a different deal. So you're just going to have to somehow or another uh, walk us out. And when we get you through this, we'll get you into a men's recovery home. We'll get you someplace else. But for the now, we just have to keep moving forward. And he said, well, what I want you to do is pray this week to your higher power that he supports your recovery. Mm -hmm. and uh i thought you got to give me something better than that that's too weak advice i need something better i didn't tell him that i just did what he said so i go to my arraignment or not arraignment but whatever it is that whenever to and i go back in the little room to make sure the plea agreement and all that read the way that we agreed you know and that's actually what you go back there and sign it and then you go out and do it formally in front of the judge so they can go through that process and he can hit the gavel and i guess it gets recorded by the court reporter and all that but I'm reading down that list and it said, uh, I got sentenced to three years, one year to be deserved on home incarceration at the following address. And the address on the paperwork was my home address, not my parents. 
Okay. One year to be served on probation. One year set aside, uh, suspended pending successful completion of the other two. And uh, the only thing I can focus on that the courts had made a mistake because they put the wrong address on the paperwork. And I don't even remember being, I don't remember the rest of that time because my wheels were spinning so bad because I thought they made a mistake and now I'm going to have to fix it. And I don't know why that bothered me so bad. Like I, I really did. It just totally consumed me. And I was like, you know, again, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And I walked out of the doors and I called my sponsor and told him about it. And he laughed. And I said, uh, what? He goes, you know what that is, don't you? And I don't know what it is. And that's become a running joke with us of uh, when he's in telling me with the different pair of glasses what something is that I can't see. He said, uh, what have you been praying for all week? And I said, I've been praying for my higher power to support my recovery. Yeah. And so when it was unsafe for me to go into that home where I was going to do that, a lot of people might chalk that up to just a plain mistake by the courts. I don't believe it because they were very adamant that I not do that here. Uh, when that became unsafe, uh, the universe arranged it where and, and fixed it for me. And people talk about AA being a program of rigorous honesty. And, and I had a few people tell me that I needed to go down there and tell them they'd made a mistake. And uh, my sponsor told me that would be undoing God's work that that had been changed for me. So that's one of my miracle list items, how that magically changed as a result of me walking this path. And I walked this out. I did my, they let me off of home incarceration three months early. I developed a beautiful relationship with my social worker slash probation officer down there. Uh, okay. We became friends. She, she attends my sobriety birthdays. Uh, a really magical thing. We've done some meditation workshops together, uh, stuff that shouldn't really happen. You shouldn't, that, that relationship is one of the things that wouldn't normally happen. Uh, and I got, and I, and, and, and I got what this 12 step process promised me is a spiritual awakening. And that spirit, that spirit that was sick inside of me was healed through that process. Uh, I became a different guy. I'm I'm a different guy in such a in in a in such a drastic way that people that knew me before don't recognize me anymore. Okay. Physically, uh, it completely changed my trajectory. Part of this thing on twelve steps, we have uh, the step twelve is uh, it's it reads like this: having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to other alcoholics and practice these principles in in all areas of our life. And that's I, I messed it up just a little bit, but it's close. Mm -hmm. So uh, carrying this message is helping other people do this work. And I found that I have a gift to do that. And my sponsor always uh, is, has always uh, encouraged me to do all 12 steps. I don't get to do it all the cart. I do them all. And, uh, and I started helping people with this at the same time. And my main real thing I want to talk about as I'm here is that story of me coming back to life and being rescued by these 12 steps and, uh, and having a way of living that, uh, that, that as Bill Wilson said in his book, a design for living that works. Uh, that's a pretty simple, powerful statement. Uh, my sponsor took, and he was writing the 12 steps. He had gathered a bunch of, he's 36 years sober, and he'd had some great teachers. And there's a lot of stuff in that that's being carried around 12-step circles. That's what might be called tribal knowledge. Uh, we just know how to do it. It's not actually in the book. And the book was written in 1935, I think published in 1939. So there's been a lot of put into practice on those principles that where we've expanded and, and, and figured out a way to wring all the effectiveness out of the process we can. And my sponsor decided to put that down in writing and format it in a way that anybody can use these 12 steps, no matter what you've got going on, uh, whether from addiction and alcoholism. And we know that the 12 steps are being used in some hundred or so different fellowships for gambling, for marijuana, for cocaine, for uh, overeating. Uh, it's being used successfully for, for millions of people in the world, but we left somebody out. Everybody forgot about the people who don't really have <laughs> any real distinguishable problem. You know, the 12 steps is set up. You have to have an ism, alcoholism, addiction. Uh, and he wrote it so that anybody can use this, uh, these tools. And the book is called 12 Step Spiritual Recovery. And the author is James Christopher Cohn. Uh, what I heard as I came into 12 Steps was uh, people would say things like, I wish everybody had a program. I wish my husband was working a program. I wish my wife, I wish, my, you know, and all that. And what it felt like is that they were saying that and then while holding the book behind their back because nobody was doing anything to give this people. Now there is Al-Anon, 
Uh, that is for people who are affected by uh, people's who they're people affected by the lives of people who are addicted, loved ones, and things like that. Um, so we set out on a mission, and he did that, and I was able to sit in the co-pilot seat. and And the way he took me through the steps is a very, I will I will say, it is an optimized way to do this work. Uh, it, uh, I have now, you know, and this is a little bit. I hesitate here because it's a little bit like tooting my own horn, but but I know it's the power of this work and it's not me. Uh, I have, I did my 18th fifth step the other night. That's people that actually work the steps. Uh, and the fifth step is where we admit to it. It's kind of a confessional in a short way, but it's where we uh, admit to myself, to God, another human being, the exact nature of our wrong. And that's where we get all our skeletons out of the closet and admit to somebody because the uh, book book says if we're not, in order to live long and happily, we have to be, completely honest with someone mm -hmm. and that's what we do here in that fifth step so i've done 18 fifth steps uh in the past four years basically and uh, every single one of those people are thriving in life uh, i watch the people and the men around me that do this work and women uh and watch how their lives have been transformed under this uh by, by applying these 12-step principles and, and and working through the concrete steps of of these 12 steps written by by really by divinely inspired and given to bill wilson uh and my sponsor has expanded and brought at the last 85 years of knowledge the best of his abilities through the teachers he's had and 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 written this and it, and it has a couple purposes one of them is to offer the 12 steps to people who do not uh currently fit in any of the traditional 12-step fellowships mm -hmm. uh, maybe you're just not happy i always ask people mm -hmm. do you have any room for a little better in your life is there any room for that? Uh, I think a lot of people are sitting around, and particularly like today with uh, what's going on with the COVID and, and, and what this pandemic has done to people's lives, is that you're sitting around, uh, the big book says, you know, my life is not supposed to be like this. There's got to be something more. Right. You know, there's got to be something more. And that little nudge inside of you, of your inner, your higher self, uh, God, what, however you want to whatever frame you want to put it in is tapping you on the shoulder and nudging you towards something better. And, uh, there's a lot of tools in the world to be able to do that. And the ones that I found and and the, the, the drum I'm beating is the one for this 12 steps, this 12 step spiritual recovery, whether it's in my addiction circles or inside the, what we call TSSR. Um, I don't know how we're doing time wise. Um, I never look at the clock. So we started having these meetings and having support group meetings here in Louisville, Kentucky. And Thursday nights is the big meeting. And last night we had it on Zoom and we've got 30 or so people coming in. And uh, the program, we've been having meetings for about a year. Uh, it's growing. Uh, people are starting to get interested in it from different places in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just a, and it's just a magical process. Yeah. These, uh, this, this accepting that you have a problem is step one that I'm powerless against. I have a problem and I haven't been able to fix it. And, you know, there's a bunch of ancient teachings and different things and even more modern ones that says you can't fix a problem from the place where which it was created. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the powerless thing and unmanageability in your life. Step one's uh, admitting that you're powerless and unmanageable. Step two is coming to believe something will work for you. The, the step is a little wordy or a little airy fairy kind of thing a little bit. It says, uh, came to believe that power greater than myself can restore me to sanity. Uh, so I got to believe this thing will work. I'm not sure that's a complete requirement, but it helps a lot if I think this will work for me. And by how I'm going to make me think it's going to work is these guys in these meetings were telling their stories and they said it worked for them. Uh -huh. Now that other thing where I want to reject what you hand to me, uh, is in in the mix but if i can accept that you seem to be this seems to be working for you then maybe i can accept that it'll work for me uh, that's step. about trust right that's about moving into the place of trust right. right i don't know that i believe it i don't know that i embody it right now but i see i can witness i can i can observe that it worked for other people so that's when we're called to step into trust yep so we do that admitting we got a problem is step one basically two is that trust element perfectly great uh, i love the way you put that uh step three is make a decision and it's got you know these 1935 words and that's something that christopher's done in his book is like updated it's kind of brought the language forward a little bit more modern now he didn't want to really tune the steps because they're a little bit lack of a better way to say it, a little sacred to the steps. And he did change them a little bit in his book to try to take some of that off. But step three says, made a decision to turn our will and our life over to the, to the care of God as we understand it, 
as we understand this power. Um, that's really deciding that you're going to take some action to do this. Mm-hmm. You're going to take, you're going to make a decision to take some action. You're going to put your care in, you know, to some level as a sponsor or some of what you're doing is putting the care of your life into my hands. Uh, Cause see, I didn't really do very good with my life. I don't do very good with it at all. Uh, I saw where my, where I, my thinking took me, uh, but I got this guy that, that seems to be doing for the past five years and nine months. My sobriety date's January the 1st, 2015. So, for the past five years and nine months, this guy has really been doing a really good job of helping me run my life. <laughs> now, what I noticed is that he ain't that good at running his either. But he's got a guy that helps him too. And that's what we do here. We chain together and hold each other's hands and support one another. So I let the sponsor start telling me what to do. And some of that was is working these steps. So that's when you get into step four is making a, in, in the old, the language in the big book says made a searching and thorough, thorough moral inventory of ourselves. So we're going to write down everything that's made us who we are today. And we got a real concrete and clean way to do that. We do it in columns. Uh, we take a spiral notebook and we start writing in columns. And as a sponsor, I leak out, to, I leak that what to do step by step by step, because you will overthink it if I give you the, all the instructions. So somehow or another, when I write this list of everything, and the, the book says we make a list of the people we were angry at, but this 12-step spiritual recovery, we're going to make a list of the people and institutions and principles that have infected and impacted who I am today. Mm-hmm. And when we sit down, we ask this power to help us gather those names. And we go through there and do that. And then we get to write out our grudge. What's, what's our beef with that person or institution? And then we look at the core stuff that it's affecting. Is it affecting our uh, ambitions, our personal relations, our sex relations? Mm-hmm. Uh, our security, our self-esteem. We look at the core principles that it's affecting. And then we write out, what did I do around that? What is my part? And we write in there what we did, because we usually find out that no, we, you know, I'm mad at you for something uh, that I started. <laughs> it's uh-huh. usually, we set the ball rolling and we have some part to play here. And what that four step does is, it, it, what it does is highlights these patterns and these, uh, these patterns and these programming really that we picked up over the course of our life that, that is not working for us. It's defeating us. It's defeating our progress. And step five, we get all that out and we talk to somebody about it and we get all our skeletons out of the closet. That was the very first time I got to, was able to release this thing about this sexual uh, um, relationship I had with this kid as a young age. It was a take it to the grave thing. I would never tell anybody about. Mm-hmm. And by releasing that, I uncorked this negativity. I took one of them apples that were rotten in my bucket and yeah. got rid of it along with some others. So set step five is a bonding thing. And, and I have that cabin out in the woods on 54 acres in Orange County, Indiana. And when I do fist steps, I take people down there on a Friday night and we sit down and have dinner and I cook steaks or whatever we like to eat over the campfire. And we do step five in a very safe and secure place where they know it's an ironclad confidence that whatever they tell me was not leaving this place. This is between me, you and our higher powers. And, uh, and you watch people change uh, through that process. So I have them do five that night. We do five, which is that, cons- that uh, getting all your, cleaning out your closet, cleaning house. And then I have them do six and seven, where six is uh, becoming willing to have uh, this power that's uh, this power greater than you, remove them off of you. And then step seven is a prayer where we ask our higher power to take this stuff away. And through that step five, uh, we, de- we define these things we call character defects. These things has been defeating us, these patterns in our lives has been defeating us. And we ask this power to take them away. And when I wake up in the next morning, uh, I, I, every single time I wake up with a different human being the next morning that I went to bed with, they are carrying a lighter aura. They are, they are transformed in that one night is magic. Uh, mm-hmm. I've actually taken some before and after pictures of people. And you can see that difference in somebody from uh, the before and after pictures of them finally getting to unload their bucket. Yeah. That must uh, it is. It's yeah. amazing to witness. <clears throat> so that gets us I'll just quickly. Eight is uh, where we uh, begin to define these people, find these people in our, in our inventory that we'd harmed. Uh, nine is actually going out to the world and making stuff, making, making things right. Mm-hmm. Uh, we let people, un, you know, tell us what we face, the people that we had harmed, uh, we'd done wrong, uh, whether that's creditors or moms or ex-wives or children. And we go out to set that stuff right. And uh, we have a very concrete amends formula, too. And that's what I love about the steps is it's very, very flexible, but we have a recipe to follow. And that recipe can vary a little bit. 
uh, and and so I have a very powerful way to to do amends with people. I rarely go tell people I'm sorry anymore. Uh, what I do with you, if I've if I've stepped on you, I, I do an amends with you, and I show up and say, hey, uh, I'm operating on a different plane today. I'm trying to be a different person than I was in the past, and that behavior I just exhibited is not who I want to be. Uh, I want to make that right. Uh, I'm I'm uh, and I get specific about what I just did. And I tell you, and I own my piece. And then I ask you, is there anything that I've done to harm you that I'm not aware of? Is there anything at all that you need to say to me? And I let that person talk, right? Because it's not just about me. Yeah. Uh, and then I ask them what I can do to repair the damage I've done, whether that means paying the money back or, or just being better than don't do it again uh, and do that. And uh, that little formula, we go out to the world and, and set things straight. And then 10, 11, and 12 is what we call the maintenance steps. 10 is to continue to do that. It's continue to take personal inventory and make right uh, all the wrongs as we go along. Uh, that's just keeping an eye on our lives, not repeating the bad behaviors. Uh, talking to my, keeping my sponsor in the loop and, 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 and doing, uh, continuing to basically do three through seven or three through nine every day as I walk along. Uh, keep on remembering I'm not running the show. I watch my behavior tell somebody about it. So if I do something stupid, I call somebody and tell on myself. Uh, and, uh, and I ask God to keep on helping me, uh, be a better version of myself at day by day. 11 is uh, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with this, uh, God of our understanding. And so prayer and meditation are big in my life. And that whole thing is, uh, opening up ways and trying to find new ways to grow in your spirit. Try to keep on feeding it because I can't, I can't set that tool down. Uh, a big piece of this is continuing to enlarge my, uh, enlarge and grow and nourish my spirit. And that spirit I'm talking about, my very inner soul. So I do that. I'm a yoga, since becoming sober, I'm a registered 200 hour yoga teacher. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> I meditate daily and I, and I try to do things to pass that on. Uh, I'm a part of the Mankind Project, which is a men helping other men become better men. Uh, I look for places that I can continue to grow and continue to be a better steward of this thing called life and be, uh, and have some purpose here so that, uh, that I'm not continuing to make the mistakes. Cause for years I was a negative influence on anybody I came in contact with and I'm balancing the karmic scales today by, uh, uh, making sure that if you run into this dude today, that you have a positive experience. And I don't care if that's me working with you through the 12 steps or bumping into you in the grocery store or in traffic or anything else. Uh, I, I want to be a different man today. And step 12 is that what I said earlier is uh, having had a result of these steps, uh, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, I try to carry this message. The book says to other alcoholics, I try to carry this message to anybody who might be able to use these tools to improve the quality of their life. Um, I do that and, uh, and I practice these principles, which is all that stuff. There's a little thing that says a uh, little joke in the 12 steps. It says, you know, sometimes I don't remember what, what day it was in the second grade, third grade, whatever it was, where they handed the, where they, where they handed out the, the guidebook on how to do this thing called life. But I was absent that day apparently because I didn't have any real way to do this thing called life. The spiritual principles I was being taught at, at, at churches was just wasn't landing with me. Uh, that my way or the highway kind of stuff was, was I, I just wasn't able to accept it. Now I have a guidebook on how to do this thing called life in a way that's working for me. And it's working for me magically. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this wood shop I have in the backyard was manifested in recovery. I love to do woodwork. One of the ways that started out was I make these little wooden tokens for people for their sobriety dates. I make little numbers and make it out of pretty wood uh, and, and do that. And, it's, and, and that was a way to do service. Service is uh, integral to that 12 step. That's part of that carrying this message. And uh, I started doing that and it's rolled into basically a part-time business right now. That's, that's keeping me really happy. Like I said, I've become a yoga teacher. Uh, yoga teacher. I do that a little. Um, but more than anything else, is having this ability to help these other people get up out of the hole. There is no single more fulfilling thing that I do. Uh, I, I work in that wood shop and I go out and do handyman stuff to pay the bills. My life's purpose, and, and I can even put that into real concrete words, is uh, my mission is to uh, create a world of healing recovery through guiding people towards their true purpose, right. to find their true selves. And I spend the majority of my life energy doing that today by taking people through these 12 steps, whether if they're alcoholic addict, 
or if they're just not real happy, you know, they, they're just yeah. suffering from, uh, just, uh, just suffering from life. And, yeah. and I do that today. Uh, and everybody that knows me, uh, <clears throat> that's how they know Dan today. That is so amazing. It has been just absolutely amazing to sit here and, and listen to your story of just a, such beautiful transformation. <clears throat> and I love how you were able to take that such deep seated, deep rooted pain and work through your own pain. And now you're transmuting it and you're sharing it with the world. I mean, you're sharing your, your gifts with the world, right? You've turned it into your purpose. And I think it's just, it's so amazing what you're doing on a daily basis. So you know, when you get this opportunity to do that, <laughs> it becomes addictive. Uh, yeah. That when you get the chance to help somebody, uh, I, I cross, you know, one of the other things is in the world of 12 steps is it's dangerous to cross the gender thing. So we don't men sponsor men and women sponsor women. Well, okay. 12 step spiritual recovery, <clears throat> the tools need to get distributed. And so I've started sponsoring women, which have brought a whole new thing into my life, a, a whole new thing. I didn't know I was missing. I had an element of a relationship with a female that wasn't based on my old motives. Mm-hmm. You know, that was another thing that completely uh, transformed my, my way of being in a, uh, okay. I've had a home, I've sponsored a couple of people who was impactful was a guy who was homeless. I used to pick him up off the, he, he would come out of these woods that were behind a church down off the interstate. And uh, he would walk out of those woods smelling and looking homeless. And I'd pick him up and I'd take him to meetings. I had no idea how to do that, but I saw him in a meeting and he asked me if I'd sponsor him. And, and I pray on that. And I talked to my sponsor and I come up that I didn't know how to do it, but surely this power will let me do that. Uh, to watch that man's life transform. And these tools and the magic happened to him. He hadn't seen a daughter in two years. Uh, two weeks after we started working with one, one another, uh, the guardian of that little girl called him out of the blue and said, hey, do you want to see, uh, I guess it doesn't matter, nobody knows, do you want to see Dorothy? So that magic just came out of nowhere. Uh, yeah. God now is like an assistant manager down at a, at a recovery shelter down in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, completely transformed. Had another guy who uh, was on the brink of uh, death. He was uh, sick, um, was probably going to die if he didn't stop drinking. Wow. And to watch these people, you know, go from that rock bottom and yeah. have, playing that little small part that I get to play today, uh, you know, brings a divorce. Uh, I have kids, uh, my sponsor's kids feel like godchildren to me. Mm-hmm. become a part of these people's family and increase yeah. that connection that is so important to me today is to have connection with my community and the people around me. Uh, and that's part of that authenticity. Uh, I'm doing this podcast called the spiritual underground podcast where I try to carry this message. And that's really my primary purpose there is just to get this word out. I don't know if these 12 step tools are for you specifically. Uh, you know, you have a program that you offer the world, uh, you know, and the more different programs that are available for people, to find where, what their fit is. Uh, cause, cause we all know we need it today. Yeah, the world is, uh, the world is a, is a crazy place. And, uh, without some, without some mm-hmm. tools and a way to do this thing, I would be lost. So now I get to do this, uh, play this little role and have a purpose for the universe where, uh, you know, the old Rick yeah. Warren book, right? A purpose filled life. Is that what right. it was? I have that book. Same yeah. mess- it's the same message. Right. You know, all this stuff is really the same yeah. stuff to- wrapped up in a way, you know, because right. certain individuals got to hear it a certain way. Right. Exactly. And, uh, and so this 12 steps is, 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 is my brand of uh, trying to reach out and, and, you know, it sounds a little pompous. It sounds overblown, whatever, but uh, it's my way to be able to go out and help the world become better. I Heal. love it. I love it. So powerful. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story with us and, you know, and just for the work that you do in the world on a daily basis to make it a, a brighter, happier place. Yeah, so if people a, would like to get in touch with you directly, what is the best way for them to do that? So uh, you can email me at uh, dan at spiritualunderground.org. Uh, and I can send this stuff to you. We do have a Facebook page of this uh, called Spiritual Underground Podcast. We we'll have an Instagram called Spiritual Underground Podcast. Uh, the 12 step spiritual recovery, which is a lot of letters, but there's a website called 12 step spiritual recovery.com that will give you everything you need to know about that. Uh, and I'm just open to people contacting me through, uh, that Dan at spiritual underground.org. Uh, if anybody's interested or is looking to thinking maybe these tools will help, uh, those are my primary ways to, uh, 
to find me. And and plus, if you would like, uh, you know, my podcast is this, is Spiritual Underground Podcast. Uh, right. And you can hear the stories of the people who actually are giving their testimony of how these 12 steps have uh, transformed their lives, similar to what I just kind of did where I told you about the way it used to be. And yeah. then what happened to me to change my trajectory. And then the better thing is what it's like today. Because right. I could I love your story. So if I, wrote, if I wrote a script for my life back when I was first getting. So if I had a real script for my life, period, I'd have sold myself short. Yeah. Because what I'm getting to have today, I could have never put on paper and asked for. Yeah. Such an amazing story. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us today and for being here. Well, thank and you. All of our viewers and listeners, I so appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be here and listen to Dan's powerful story of healing. Um, once again, I would like to invite you to my Facebook group, liveauthentically.today slash FB. Check out a copy of my bookstore when you have a chance when you're on Amazon. And you can also check me out on my website, liveauthentically.today and learn about my services. I'm an individual life coach. I do group coaching and reach out to me and we will get you on your path to your spiritual awakening. Thanks everyone and have a great day. Mm -hmm.